Buying your first home in Seattle, Washington, it's a great way to build wealth. According to the US Census, homeowners have an average of 40 times the net worth of renters. That's 255,000 versus 6,300 for renters. Let's jump into the six steps how to buy a home in Seattle, Washington. Determine your budget, that's number one. The first step is to determine your budget. A lot of that is going to be dependent upon you. It's going to be dependent on your credit, your income, and your overall debt level. A good rule of thumb is 2836 rule. Basically, your house payment should not be greater than 20% of your gross monthly income. The 36 is if you add your house debt and your other debt, like your credit card debt or student loan debt, the ratio should not be more than 36% of your monthly income. Number two, get pre-approved. The second step is to get pre-approved. You're going to want to have that pre-approval letter because sellers are going to take you more seriously. And oftentimes it will help win or even be able to get into the negotiation game with the sellers. So it's important to get pre-approved and know what you qualify for. Also, if something comes up on your credit, it's important to be able to address that upfront versus on the back end. We recommend looking at local mortgage brokers and we like local mortgage brokers for a reason. If you use a local mortgage broker versus a 1-800 number, if they don't treat you right, we can go look them in the eye, we can go knock on the door and make sure that they treat you right and provide you with the five-star service. We also like working with local mortgage brokers that we do a lot of business with. And the reason for that is accountability. They know that if they don't treat you right, they're not going to get that next client to serve from us. When you talk to the local mortgage broker, you'll find there are a lot of favorable financing options out there, especially for first time home buyers. There's an FHA financing, which is 3.5% down payment. And there are VA loans out there that are 100% financing if you're a military veteran. There are also USDA loans, which are 100% financing. And you'd be surprised by some of the areas that qualify for what's considered a rural development loan. But when you go that route, you can get 100% financing and a zero down payment out of your pocket. Number three, budget for closing costs. The next step is to determine a plan for your closing costs. On average, your closing costs are between 2% to 4% of the overall purchase price of your home. A great benefit of buying in a buyer's market or a market where there's slightly more inventory is that you can sometimes get the seller to pay for either a portion or of all the closing costs. So if you're doing a USDA loan or a VA loan, that's 100% financing. Sometimes you can buy a home with zero money out of pocket. Another great thing to do if you are concerned about closing costs or budgeting for closing costs is to look at shopping with builders. We can help navigate some of um, the builders that pay for either a portion or all the closing costs when you buy that new home. Number four, plan for upfront and out-of-pocket expenses. The next thing is to budget and plan for your upfront out-of-pocket expenses. There are several things that you're going to need to plan for when purchasing your first home. And the first one is earnest money. Earnest money shows the seller that you are committed and serious about purchasing the home. And the amount varies. We see anywhere between $500 to even up to $50,000 on a purchase. But typically on your first home, you're going to see 500, 1,000, maybe $4,000 uh, on the first purchase on average. The second thing is uh, the appraisal. This is one of your closing cost item. An appraisal is something that helps protect you and the bank so you don't overpay for your home. That's the fee that you need to pay upfront and it's typically going to range from $450 to $1,000. That is paid out of pocket and upfront most of the time. However, if the seller pays your closing cost and you write the contract correctly, you can get the money reimbursed to you at closing. The third thing is your home inspection. Now that's something that you don't want to have the seller to pay for because you want the home inspector looking out for your best interest. You're going to want to hire a home inspector 
and we're recommending to do a sewer scope inspection as well, especially if the home is um, a little older. The fourth thing is your moving expenses and your utility hookups. Number five, select a real estate agent. You've got your budget, you're pre-approved, you know the area that you want to purchase in, and it's now time to select a real estate agent. We're, we're in this review economy, so one of the best ways to find a great agent is to check out reviews. Don't take a real estate agent's word for it. Check out their reviews to see what past clients have said about working with them. If you look at our reviews, you'll find that Vladimir Grigorov Real Estate has a lot of five-star reviews and we're ready to provide you with five-star service and buying your first home. It's important also to find an agent that's going to sit down with you and provide you with good advice to help navigate you through the purchase of your first home. Number six, paperwork. You've done all of the above steps and you found your dream home. Now your next step is your real estate agent is going to help you draft the paperwork to make that home yours. Some of the things that you need about in drafting that paperwork. Number one is earnest money, which is a deposit that goes towards the purchase of the home. And that will get credit back to you at the closing of that home. Number two is your purchase price. How much are you going to offer for that home? Your real estate agent is going to help you provide what's called a CMA, a competitive market analysis, to make sure you're paying the right amount and not paying too much for that home. Number four is your closing cost. That is typically between two to 4% of the overall purchase price. And you should um, now know what your closing costs are by working with your local lender. Your real estate agent is going to help estimate that, but really what matters is the estimate that your lender gives you for the purchase of the home, and that's your closing cost. You want to also negotiate or factor in who's going to pay for that. Is it going to be the buyer or is it going to be the seller paying for the closing cost at closing? Fourth is the inspection. How long do you need to uh, do the inspection? Oftentimes, we see anywhere between four to 15 working days, which is one to three weeks. How much time are you going to give yourself and your home inspector to go through the, the home inspections? The next thing to be thinking about is your closing date. Talk to your local lender to find out how long it takes to close your loan. For example, an USDA loan might take longer than a conventional loan. How long do you need to close the loan and how much time do you need personally to prepare your finances as well? What's typical is anywhere between about 30 to 60 days on, on average. How to, build own, how to build wealth by owning a home. There are four keys ways to build wealth through owning a home. Number one is appreciation. The first one is the biggest one and is through home appreciation or what's really Inflation. We're going to continue to have inflation in this country because the government is going to continue to print money. They have to continue to print money because of the massive debt load that they have. They got to reduce the amount of debt that they have by having more currency out there in the marketplace. When you own hard assets, such a home, that's going to increase your net worth and it's going to increase your net worth even more than a lot of other investment vehicles. Because when you purchase a home, you can buy that through leverage. If you're putting 5% down or 10% down, the money is being leveraged. You're not only getting the value of the appreciation of your 5% or 10% investment, but you're actually getting the appreciation of the entire investment, which multiplies and compounds your investment to a very high level. Principal reduction. The second way is to principal reduction. When you have a 30 or a 15 year mortgage, a percentage of that payment goes towards principal reduction. That principal reduction portion grows over time as you continue to make payments, which becomes equity that you are able to tap in when you sell your home. Tax savings. 
The third one is tax savings. The government is your business partner when it comes to buying your first home or even buying a rental property. The reason they do that is one, investors are better at providing housing than government is. And the second, they need first time home buyers. They need home buyers taking on mortgage debt to be able to provide and fund the government debt that they have. So they're your business partner providing tax savings and tax advantages for you to buy your first home and buy your rental properties as well. Fixed rate mortgage. The fourth one is the fixed rate mortgage. This last one is really make us the envy of the old with our 30 year and 15 year fixed mortgage rate products. Your debt simply becomes worth less over time as inflation rates go up. How to access your home equity. I know what you're thinking. You've got all this equity now, since on average your home equity is about 255,000 for a homeowner versus only at 6,300 for a renter. How do you access that equity? Do you have to sell your home to be able to access it or buy another home? Of course, you can sell your home to access it. Or you can do what's called a home equity line of credit or do a cash out refinance to pull out that money to be able to invest in other real estate properties or even go on a vacation. If you're ready to start building your network by buying your first home, send me an email at no at realestatevladimirg.com and let's get started.